All right, how you doing? It's not raining. That's good. Did you enjoy your snow day? Did you? Who made a snowman? Who made a snowman that doesn't have kids? Very nice. Kayla's did. Carolyn did. Anybody? Miss Melton did. Very good. Harris's did. I, uh, so, what did you say, Carolyn? No, I said I made a snowman that had four hundred. Very good. Everything tastes better with sugar on it. All right. A little Eagle brand milk. Can't go wrong. All right. So, uh, hey, it is really good to see you. Um, it's been a tough week. We, uh, tomorrow is going to be the, uh, the, the service for Deb McCuller and uh, our hearts are just broken uh, for, um, for Deb and for her family and, and uh, sweet friends here at Brookwood and we're certainly going to miss her and uh, even with that happening and then I was in a meeting last Wednesday before I came in here and by Thursday morning uh, Joe Tarr who was in that meeting also was like testing positive and so it was just like wow this is crazy um, and so, and then it was on, uh, I guess Saturday when we found out about Deb. And so, uh, so anyway, we just want you to understand that, uh, that we recognize that we're dealing with something that is very serious and is still very present among us. And so please, please follow our guidelines. Um, please follow the love your neighbor, uh, guidelines that we have for you. Um, you know, the, the, the worst thing that, I mean, I think about with Deb is that, is that you know, did, did somebody, certainly not intentionally, but did somebody unwittingly because they were being careless or just choosing not to wear a mask, you know, infect her? We don't know. We don't have any, any idea. We won't know that. But um, I can't stand the idea that, that I would be a part of that. And so I'm going to wear my mask when I'm out and about and, um, and uh, among the people here and wherever I am. And I hope that you will assume that, to me, Christ-like practice of loving people more than your own uh, rights or privileges or whatever you want to say about that. So, um, so anyway, all right. So everybody has a, uh, let's move along. Everybody has a, um, oh, by the way, I tested negative on Monday, so, and, you know, so anyway, no, no problems there. Uh, John Walker also tested negative today, and so he's here also, so we're all good. Uh, everybody has an outline, a little half sheet. You got that front and back, all right? So on the, the side that you should be on should say at the top the story week one review, all right? I have a little clicker here. So tonight we are talking about, uh, and if you have a question if you've already filled that out, just feel free uh, to take that back to the table. Um, if you've got a question and you filled it out, uh, take it back to the table, and Miss Jennifer will take that, or Scott will get, get that, and we'll answer those at the end. So our plan tonight is to go until 7 p.m., and then at 7, if we have some question answer, we'll do that, and then, um, and then we'll be done by 7.15 so that you are ready to get your children when they are dismissed. If you can wait until 7.30, uh, the children's pro ministry program finishes around 7.30, and so if you can wait until then to, to grab your kids, they won't miss anything. Um, uh, but if you have to grab them, we certainly understand, but just know that they go till 7.30. My plan is to have you out by 7.15 so that there's no uh, delay in picking up your kids when they're done. All right, so tonight we're talking about uh, part two, and, and the, the theme slide here is the picture of a ram, and why do you think tonight is a picture of a ram? Because we're going to talk about who? Abraham and his son Isaac, very good, all right, and so I told you every week I was going to be giving you some, um, some uh, resources, and so last week I told you about Knowing Faith podcast and then God's Big Story podcast, Knowing Faith is for moms and dads, um, uh, God's Big Story is for kids, uh, this is an excellent, excellent resource, this is called the Bible Project, you can find it at BibleProject.com. Um, they have all kinds, they've got podcasts and they've got printed uh, material of, for, for Bible resources and they've got these incredible illustrated explanations of key Bible terms and books of the Bible. And so they, uh, a narrator explains a book of the, of the Bible, say, let's say Genesis, 
from the beginning to the end. And as he's explaining, an illustrator is drawing all of this. It is, I'm telling you, it is lights out. If you use the, um, the Bible recap, Bible reading plan uh, that I encouraged some of you to do last year, maybe some of you doing it this year, uh, this is what they use to introduce books of the Bible. It is so great. And if you learn uh, by visually like I do, I learn visually. I just don't learn from sitting and listening. I need to see something. Um, that this is an incredible resource for that. And so just know that, that, is, uh, that that's, that's available at BibleProject.com, another great resource that is accessible to you. All right, so let's do, uh, let's do a couple of things. Let's read our little funny story from last week. I got this from... Uh, uh, Catherine Slack, remember that? She gave me that. And so the, tonight's recap uh, or summary is a very small portion. And uh, remember last week we read all the way up to, uh, to Noah who asked some other people to join him in the ark, but they said they'd have to take a rain check. Wah, wah, wah. Here comes some more. After Noah came Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob was more famous than his brother Esau because Esau sold Jacob his birthmark in exchange for some pot roast. Jacob had a son named Joseph who wore a really loud sports coat. <laughs> so there you have it. That's our funny summary for uh, tonight. Now, um, so there's several things we're going to do tonight. I'm, I'm gonna, we're going to do a review. We're going to do some breakdown of uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then I'm going to go through and try to answer these discussion questions that are at the back of the book, the story, right? And so I hope that you did that um, as I, I didn't even bring my storybook in here with me. Um, as I went through the story, uh, I, I made tons of notes in the margins. Uh, I wanted to know where, where, where the biblical text was coming from. Uh, and so it was really good Bible study to have my Bible open as I was reading the story and making sure that I understood where I was in the biblical text as far as chapter and verse. And so it takes a little bit longer to read it that way, but man, was it helpful to even remind, to, to remind myself about where these things are. And so it was really, really beautiful. Um, as we're getting started, I want to let you know about something. I was kind of running around because I wanted to visit. We have a Bible study that begin, began tonight being taught by uh, Christy Robinson. Uh, Christy Robinson used to work for uh, CASA, y'all remember that, or Volunteers for Youth Justice, Northwest Louisiana. Uh, now she's, she's uh, left CASA and has started her own nonprofit called Faith and Fostering. And so they are taking uh, right now young women who have aged out of the foster program, or out of DFS, uh, Department of Family Services, and, um, and, have, uh, and have no place to go. Um, and so she is working with these folks. She has a, a residence where, where young women can live. She's got apartment complexes that are providing up an apartment for a young woman in that kind of a situation. And so she started a Bible study uh, on Romans. And so I wanted to go back there and meet the girls and their mentors and the leaders of that ministry. And so that's happening back in 213 uh, tonight. And so I'm really excited uh, that that's going on. It's very, very good. So uh, love what Christy is doing with faith and fostering. All right, so let's do a little bit of a recap, all right? I encouraged you, I encouraged you to, uh, as we're reading through the story, that, that what we were going to do is, is focus on the main things, right? Because the main things are what? The plain things, and the plain things are the main things, right? And so there are some things, I've already fielded one question today, that's not a plain thing. And so if it's not a plain thing, then it must not be a, a main thing, right? And so we'll answer those questions as best we can, but we have to realize that we don't know fully some of these answers because they are not the, and but because we don't know the answer, it's not a plain thing. If it's not a plain thing, it's not a main thing, right, 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 right. All right, so Seven days of creation. Seven days of creation. How many memorize the seven days of creation? How many remember the, 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 uh, the two categories of the first six days? There were, there were two categories. The first three days are days of what? Forming. That's exactly right. Days of forming. And so three days of forming. Day one, light and dark. Day two, waters. Day three, land and sea, and on day three, the earth begins to produce vegetation, all right? And so you got light and dark, waters, land and sea. Um, the question that I fielded today was, if 
the sun doesn't show up until day four, then what's producing the light on day one? And the answer to that question is, we don't know. We don't know. And this is where we have to remember that, uh, who did we say last week wrote the book of Genesis? And he wrote it for who? He wrote it for the Israelites, right? And where had the Israelites been for the last 400 years? In Egypt, that's exactly right. In Egypt, did they worship one god or many gods? Many gods. And so what is Moses doing for the children of Israel? He's writing for them a, uh, what would become the Pentateuch, these five books, to help them to understand that the Lord is their God and the Lord is one, right? And so this is not a seventh grade science textbook. Genesis chapter 1, chapters 1 and 2 is not. It's not intended to give us a scientific explanation for creation. It is intended to tell us that God created. In the beginning, God created. And so, where does the light come from? I don't know. I don't know. I know, and I know that in Revelation, there's no need for sun or moon because the Lamb provides the light, right? And Jesus is the light of the world. And so, is the, is the, is the light emanating from the Trinity? Is the light emanating from blank space? Is the light? I don't know. I don't have any. And the Bible doesn't tell us. And so we don't know. All right. So three days of forming, uh, three days of filling, right? That's the second category, three days of filling. And so we fill, God fills the heavens, sun, moon, and stars. He fills uh, the sea and the air with birds and fish. And then on the sixth day, he creates animals, mammals, and human beings, all right, on the sixth day. So you got two categories. Days one through three are days of what? Forming. Days four through six are days of filling. That's a really great structure to help you remember what's happening in the process of creation. In the beginning, God created. Three days he formed. For three days he filled. And on day seven, he did what? He rested. That's exactly right. So there is three days of forming, three days of filling, and one day of rest. Now, last week we said to you that Genesis shows up. The Genesis is very important because it it helps us to understand um, three things. Remember what those three things were. It helps us to understand where we've what, where we've been, right? So. Our great, the great questions of life, you remember those great, great big questions that everybody has? Who is God? Who am I? Why am I here? Uh, what's the problem? What's the solution, right? Five big questions that we're all asking. Who is God? Who am I? Why am I here? What's the problem? Because something's wrong with this place. And what's the solution, all right? And the Bible answers all those questions. Genesis tells us where we've been. It tells us who God is, who I am. It tells us why I'm here, and it tells us what the problem is, right? And it begins to show us what the solution is. And so it tells us where we've been. It tells us where we are. And so the same thing that happened in the garden happens when? Every day of our lives, right? Every day of our lives, God offers to us a perfect relationship with him. And what do we do? Um, No. I'd like to have this. I'd like to have that instead of God, right? So every day this thing plays itself over and over and over again. So it tells us where we've been, where we are, and it tells us also what? Where we're headed, right? And so the revelation ends where? In a in a garden. I will be their God. You will be they will be my people. There'll be no more tears, no more sorrow, no more pain. All those things are wiped away. It sounds a whole lot like Genesis 1, doesn't it? In the Garden of Eden, in a perfect relationship. And so uh, that is Genesis, shows us where we've been, where we're going, or where we are and where we're going. Now, we described the book, the, the Bible, and with a sentence. And that sentence was, the Bible is one big, I just told you, it's one big story about a great big, all right, say that, say that with me. It's one big story about a great big God. And that's what it is. So is it meant to be a science book? It's not meant to be a scientific explanation of things. It's meant to tell us a story of God 
his relationship with the human creation, his human creation, how it was broken, and how he fixed it. That's what it is. That's what it's all about. And if you can kind of get that in your head, it's going to help you answer a ton of questions, for, especially for your children, for your grandkids. Now, we, we said that there were shadows of, of, the, um, of the solution early on, right? So, so what happens in the garden? They eat the fruit that they weren't supposed to eat from. God shows up. They're naked. They're wearing, they're wearing leaves. Uh, God says, where are you? They say, we're hiding from you. Um, and then they blame each other, right? And then God says to the serpent, because you've done this, I'm going to put conflict or enmity between you and the seed of the woman. You will bite him on the ankle, but he will do what? Crush your head. And so we had some, immediately we got some symbols of God's solution. And so the first symbol was the seed of the woman, right? Genesis 3.15. Who remembers that long theological term that I gave you about what this is? Anybody remember that? Proto-evangelium. Very good. The first gospel, right? The first sign of a gospel is right here in Genesis 3.15. And then we saw it in uh, the story of, uh, of the skins, right? What does God do? The, the, the man and the woman try to cover their shame, and they do it in an insufficient way. And so what does God do? Genesis 3.21, he kills an animal and provides skins for them to wear. And so they cover their shame by virtue of a sacrifice, right? That sounds an awful lot like the gospel, doesn't it? And then the last thing is the ark. That's the other story that we talked about last week is the ark. The people, Noah and his family, they, they enter into the ark and God shuts the door, right? And what does Jesus say about himself? I am the door in John chapter 10. And so the ark is a picture of salvation, Okay, so now let's move along here to uh, this next, to the kind of the subject of our chapter this week. And so last week you had to read two chapters, okay? And if you like my wife, last night she said to me, uh, how many chapters were we supposed to read? And so, that's all right. Uh, this week you'll be in chapter three, okay? The story of Joseph is where we're going to be this week. Uh, or this for next this coming week, but for tonight, uh, you would have read the chapter on God creation, and then God builds a nation, and so that's where we're going to be. Is this idea that there's a in the story of God, He builds a nation, and we're going to look this this chapter covers Genesis chapter 12 through Genesis chapter 37. Now to backtrack just a little bit and give you again the, the kind of and hey did y'all did y'all catch the timeline at the beginning of each chapter? There's a timeline at the bottom there. Did y'all see that? And there's also really important. There's a timeline right around the table of contents, either right before or right after the table of contents. And I apologize for not bringing my book. I was going to bring that. Um, but if you look at that timeline. If you want to make some notes on that timeline right quick, at the, at the very top of the timeline, it, it has um, creation and Noah and the flood and maybe the Tower of Babel or something like that, um, or maybe the, the birth of Abraham. Um, but but that, that covers Genesis 1 through 11, all right? So that area right there is Genesis 1 through 11. And it really, until we get to the, to the, um, the birth of Abraham, we, we, we don't have any dates for all of that. And so by virtue of the, the years of the genealogies in Genesis, uh, we generally date um, the beginning to 6,000, right, 6,000 B.C., so roughly 8,000 years ago. Um, now, y you know scientists don't say that at all, right? Scientists say millions, billions of years, whatever. Um, and so, again, the Bible doesn't make those things clear. And so it, that means it's not a main thing, right? And so we don't, we don't, we don't worry about that. We don't get in arguments about those kinds of things. Um, what was I going to say? Uh, so uh, Genesis 1 through 9 is what we mainly focused on last week, creation, Noah and the flood, Genesis 10 is a table of nations, and so there's a kind of a telling of the families of uh, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Uh, is that right? The sons of uh, the sons of Noah. 
And then uh, Genesis 11 is a very important story. And in Genesis 11, man chooses to be God to make a name for himself. And how does he try to be God? What does man, what do all the men in the world try to do? They come together and they do what? They build a, a tower, right? So Genesis 11 is the story of the Tower of Babel. Now, it wasn't called the Tower of Babel when they were building it, but it was called the Tower of Babel afterwards because what did God do at the Tower of Babel? He saw what their intention was. He saw that through their ingenuity and through their coming together that they were going a direction that needed to be stopped. And so he did what? He confused their language, right? So that's why we call it the Tower of Babel because they couldn't understand one another. And um, that's a really important story because it contrasts with Genesis chapter 12. So in Genesis 11, man chooses to be God to make a name for himself. In Genesis chapter 12, God chooses a man to make his name known among the nations. Can you see the parallel there? And again, this is like a thing that happens all through Scripture, right? God creates man decreates. Man tries to make his own creation. God stops him, and then there's another new creation, right? That's the story of our salvation. And I don't want to, I'm not trying to beat this thing, and I'm not trying to find salvation under every rock in the Old Testament, but I'm telling you that there are thematic patterns throughout the Old Testament that point us towards the completed work of Jesus over and over and over again. Again, so God has made a perfect creation, and then he's coming along after man's rebellion and having to bring a new creation into, into existence uh, to make his name known among the nations. And that's what's happening in Genesis chapter 12. And so if you got your Bibles, open them up to Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. This is very important. Um, there, there are covenants in the Bible where, where God makes promises, right? And when God makes a promise, God keeps his promise. And so, um, and so Gen- Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. Now, we've been told about the birth of, uh, of Abraham, and I'm going to call him Abraham. I know it says Abram here, but God changes his name pretty early on, and so I'm, I'm just going to call him Abraham because that's, that's how we know the guy. So uh, we learn about the birth of Abraham at the end of chapter 11. And in, in verses 1 through 3 of chapter 12, the Lord says to Abraham, Go from your country and your kin, your kindred, and your father's house to the land that I will show you. It's not the last time he's going to say that to Abraham. And I will make of you a what? A great nation. And I'm going to do what? I will bless you. And him who dishonors you, I'm sorry, I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And so this is called the Abrahamic covenant. God makes a covenant with Noah, right? What's the covenant he makes with Noah? We see it in the Rainbow in the sky, right? What does the rainbow in the sky mean? It means God is not going to show his wrath any longer through a flood. Not that he's not going to show his wrath, but the rainbow says, I'm not going to show my wrath through a flood ever again. Um, Abraham, is, he's made a covenant. Abraham, how many kids does Abraham have at this moment? Zero. His name means exalted father. Abram means exalted father. When God changes his name to Abraham, guess what that means? I got a slide here. I should be showing you this. All right, let's look right quick at this map. So God calls Abraham out of Ur, right? And so here's here's Ur down here at the bottom, okay? This is present day Iran, right? Here's Baghdad. You see that? Y'all, am I, am I, y'all seeing me? See, if you see it, say, I see it. Okay, so this all right here, this Tigris and Euphrates, the Mesopotamian Valley, that's Iran. Where's Iraq? Well, it's, it's over here, right? It's, it's to the east. What, what's right here? What's that area right there? What do we call that? That's Saudi Arabia, right? Where, where's Israel? Way over 
over here, little bitty Israel. Right? That's little bitty Israel, right? And so, um, but that, that's, that's the map. And so Abram is going to get called from Ur to go to Haran, which is where his father's families live. And Haran is going to come back up again. And then uh, he, he is eventually, his family is going to head down and inhabit this area right here after they spend a couple of centuries in, in uh, Egypt. All right, so Abram means exalted father. Abraham means father of? Abraham bore that name, father of many, for years, decades before he had one son. Can you imagine walking around, your name means father of many, and you got no kids? Abraham is called our father, right? His father Abraham had many sons, right? And many sons had Father Abraham, and I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord, right? So why am I a son of Abraham? Because of what? Faith. Abraham believed. Even when things were not sight, Abraham believed, and his faith compelled him to action. He believed God, and he obeyed. Faith without obedience, James says, is a dead faith. And so Abraham is the father of our faith. And so Abraham had a wife. What was Abraham's wife's name? Right. Started out Sarai, but it is Sarah. Both those names mean princess. I found something interesting that I had never seen before. And, of course, I didn't bring my storybook in here, so I have to do this by memory. But In Genesis chapter 17, verses 6 and 16, we are told that this nation is going to bring many kings into the world. In Genesis 35 and verse 11, Jacob receives the same promise. And so Sarah, being a princess, is going to, from her womb, is going to come many kings. And we know also is going to come the king of kings, right? And so... Start thinking about, hopefully this whole process is going to get you thinking about those kinds of things, right? That the ultimate fulfillment of these prophecies all find their fulfillment in who? In Jesus. They find their fulfillment in Jesus. Okay, so Abraham, so there's some, there's some crazy things about this story, right? And this, this ought to bring you some comfort. It, it brings me comfort, right? Because these are not perfect people, are they? Joshua chapter 24, verses 2 and 3 tells us that Abraham lived among pagan people that worshipped idols. Now, does that mean that Abraham was a pagan person? Well, we don't know that. We don't know. It doesn't say that. But what it does say, for sure it says that they are, um, that he lived among a pagan people, right? Um, In the story of Abraham, Abraham gives his wife Sarah away for fear of his own life. He he tells these different kings, he tells them that she's his sister, right, for fear that they'll kill him to have her as his wife. Instead, they just take her as their wife because he's only his sister. He doesn't do that one time. He does that two times. Husbands, this is not an example to follow. It's one thing we're going to learn tonight is that many times these biblical characters are not examples to follow. Lived among pagans, gave uh, Sarah away. Um, Sarah gave Hagar to Abraham, right? Right? God tells them you're going to have children. They haven't had any kids. And so what what does Sarah do? Very customary, very customary. We see this in the story of Jacob for sure. Sarah goes to Hagar and she says, Hagar, here is uh, Abraham, here's my servant Hagar. Y'all sleep together. Y'all conceive a child. This will be the child of promise. Problem, right? Because that's not God's plan. There are great consequences, friends, when we choose our plan to accomplish God's plan. It doesn't work. The son born to Hagar, what's his name? Ishmael. Who is Ishmael? We read about him not only in our Old Testament, but we also read about him in the Koran. He is a distant relative of Muhammad. Oh, is that my book? Thank you very much, sir. 
Thank you very much. He's a distant relative of Muhammad. He is considered to be the father of Islam. When we choose to accomplish God's plan our way, friend, there are great consequences. Do you agree with that? Great and grave consequences. All right. Abraham and Sarah, after Hagar is, uh, conceives and gives birth to Ishmael. Um, and by the way, the Bible describes Ishmael, the prophecy of Ishmael is that he will be a wild donkey of a man, right? And again, and I, this is not meant to be ethnically, um, um, I mean, this is totally politically incorrect, but it's biblical, friends. Uh, we, we understand how that plays itself out in the world today, don't we? All right, so um, Abraham and Sarah have a child. That child's name is Isaac, right? His name is Isaac. Um, let's talk about the life of Isaac and Abraham and Sarah's world. Uh, Genesis chapter 22, what happens? It says, the Lord did what? Tested Abraham, right? Genesis chapter 22, verse 1, the Lord tested Abraham. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. And he said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on the mountain, which I shall tell you, which I will show you. Sound familiar? Sounds just like Genesis chapter 12, right? What's God saying to Abraham? Trust me. Trust me. And so Abraham does that, right? We know the story. You read it last week. Abraham takes a couple of servants, wakes up Isaac. They go to the Mount Moriah. They go to the place where God would show them. Abraham says to his servants, me and the boy are going to the mountain to worship. That's the very first time that we see the word worship in the Bible. The very first time. This is Genesis chapter 22 and verse 5. Abraham said, uh, stay here with the donkey to the servants. I and the bull will go over there and we will worship. And so worship involves, in Abraham's mind, great sacrifice, right? Because he's being told to sacrifice his own son. They get there. Isaac's bound up. On the way, Isaac says, where's the sacrifice, daddy, right? Well, I see the wood for the fire. I see the knife for the sacrifice. But I don't see an animal to sacrifice. And what does Abraham tell his son Isaac? God will provide, right? That becomes the name of that place, Jehovah Jireh. God will provide. And so Abraham binds Isaac up with the ropes, puts him on the wood, um, the altar, raises the knife, right? And the angel of the Lord says, wait a minute. God's seen your faithfulness that compels you to action. Don't do a thing. Don't hurt the boy. Don't raise a hand against a hair on his head. And then behind him in the bushes, what does Abraham hear? A ram caught in the thicket. God provided a sacrifice. Again, shadows, shadows of the redemption story. God provided a sacrifice. Uh, Isaac grows up. What do you think Isaac does when he gets married? He gives Rebecca away to save his own life. Again, husbands, not an example to follow, right? But that's what Isaac does. Again, these people are tragically flawed in very odd ways as we will read through the Bible. To Isaac and Rebecca, there are born twins, right? Who is the firstborn? Esau is the firstborn. What does Esau look like? He's hairy. He is covered in red hair, right? The Edomites are the descendants of Esau. They are red people, right? And so, so that's what Esau is. Esau was the firstborn. Now, when he was born, now sometimes there's a gap. Some of y'all got twins in here. I know the Joneses are in here. Y'all got some twins. Y'all got some Carters. You got twins. So there's twins all around, right? Usually you got one twin, and then you got to wait a minute, right? For the other twin to come usually? Not this time. Esau's born and holding on to his foot, right, is this other 
Joker. And his name is Jacob, which means heel snatcher. That's what it means. Or con artist is honestly somebody who will trip you up. So Jacob and Esau grow up. Esau is a daddy's boy. He's a hunter, fisher, provider for the outdoorsman kind of guy, right? Jacob is a mama's boy. Rebecca wants Jacob to receive the birthright. God wants Jacob to receive the birthright because that seems to be the way that God's going to work. God's going to bring about in the lives of all his people a, a, a pattern of passing along the family blessing in a way that's contrary to the world. And so the firstborn, the world says, is the one that gets the family blessing. But not in God's plan. It's usually the secondborn or even in the case of Joseph, the the 11th born. And so, um, and so Esau's not the one to receive the birthright. And so Rebecca hatches this plan. Isaac follows through with it. Isaac deceives his father, right? Deceives his father to get the birthright or the blessing. That's what he gets, the blessing. And then Esau shows up and he's all hungry. And Jacob's been cooking in the kitchen. And so he, Esau trades his birthright for a bowl of stew. So Jacob deceives his father, Jacob deceives his brother. This is the man whose name would eventually be changed to Israel. Genesis chapter 32 tells us the story. Jacob is, and this is a, it's a great story, right? Did you read it? It's a great story. Jacob is scared for his life. He is fleeing his uncle Laban, right? Whom he's married his two daughters, Rachel and Leah, crazy story. I uh, wish I could tell it, but there's not enough time to tell it. Um, but Jacob's married these two ladies, Rachel and Leah. They got a bunch of kids together, about, uh, about 11 kids at this point. I don't think Benjamin's been born yet. But uh, they've had to flee from Laban's household. Then Jacob hears that Esau is coming, so he's fleeing, he's fleeing Laban, Uncle Laban, the girl's daddy, his father-in-law. He's Fearing Esau, who's coming because he's done what to Esau? He's ruined his life, right? Stolen the blessing, robbed him of his birthright. And so what does Jacob do? He sends over his least favorite wife first to meet Esau. Quality individual. With lots of stuff, right? I mean, he's just going to full out bribe him, you know? I've got all this property that he got from his father-in-law, Laban, and, and so he just sends it over to, to appease his, um, his, his, his brother Esau. He, uh, on the night, that they're all, the night before they're all going to meet, he sends everybody across the river, Jabuk, right? And he sends first Leah, who he doesn't like so much, uh, and then behind her, kind of protected by the crowds, um, Rachel and, and Joseph. And, and yeah, Rachel, because Rachel dies giving birth to Benjamin. And so it's just Joseph. It's Rachel and Joseph in that household. And then he stays at the very rear, right? Again, quality individual. He stays at the very back. Well, that night, guess what happens? He meets God. He has a come to Jesus meeting with God. And they wrestle. This is a huge part of the story. Because... The angel of the Lord says, let me go. And he says, not till you bless me. Sounds a lot like Jacob, doesn't it? And the angel of the Lord says, tell me your name. Now, names have meaning, don't they? We name our, we, we go through a long list of, of names that we uh, like the sound of. But in the Old Testament, they named folks because their names had meaning. They meant something. What does Jacob's name mean again? Heel snatcher. Con, what's Jacob been doing all his life? He's been bending the rules, <laughs> making his own way. He's been a huckster, a con artist. That's what he's done. So when God says, tell me your name, he's just not asking for his ID. It's a confession. Here I am, fleeing from my father-in-law, scared to death of Esau. Here I am, Jacob. And God changes his name at that moment from a very earthy, 
from a very earthbound description of his sinful nature to a Godward name. Israel means wrestling with God. Wrestling with God. And that's what the nation would do, right? For, it, for the, all the Old Testament, right? Here's the, here's the nation of Israel. Where you cannot describe their relationship with God as anything but a struggle. Anything but a struggle. And, and that's the picture that we see on this side of, of the river at Jabbok. Now, what happens when Jacob comes across the river? And boy, he's got, a, he's got a, a limp, right? Because the angel touches his hip and there's something happens in there. And so he's limping across and he limps the rest of his life, right? They say, what happened to you? I'll tell you later. You know, I don't know what he said. But um, he, he, he's confronted with Esau. Esau's there, right? And what does Esau do? Esau runs to Jacob and puts his arms around him. Now, just back up for a second. Think about this story. Which one of these guys would you choose? Honest, hardworking, outdoorsman, forgiving, or the con artist sending his wife ahead of himself in the, after the pattern of Abraham and Isaac, right? Which one of these guys would you choose? I mean, if we're writing the story, Esau's our main character, right? He's the he, but that's not God's story. So what we have when we look at all of this, these stories, we, we see biblical characters that are tragically flawed. Sorry, I misspelled R there. Uh, all biblical characters are tragically flawed. They are generally proof of God's faithfulness not to kill us for being stupid. Friends, a lot of times we disqualify ourselves, don't we? We tell God why we can't do something. God, I can't do that because I've, I did this back when I was a kid. I had this struggle when I was a teenager. I did this in my first marriage or whatever, you know. I'm, I'm so flawed, I can't be used. You ever feel that way? If that was the case, our Bible would be full of blank pages. If God did not use tragically flawed people. Friends, there's nobody in this room that is disqualified from God's usage in great ways for his great purpose of bringing glory to himself. And so, I just want you to see that. These people are tragically flawed. Um, let's, let's do a little bit of, uh, of discussion, question, answer. I've already done some of this. Um, uh, what, what was... What was God's reward for Abraham if he would go? What was he going to see? If you go, I will make you into what? A great nation, right? And then he says, through this nation, I'm going to bless all the nations of the world. Listen to this incredible quote by uh, a guy whose name I can't even pronounce. Um, he says, Abraham does not receive a command to carry Yahweh's blessings to the nations. Rather, the nations are promised to divine blessing if and when they see Abraham's faith in Yahweh and then establish contact with his descendants. So it's not that Abraham is going around saying, you know, I bless you, I bless you, I bless you, right? It's that through Abraham's relationship with God, the faith that moved him to action and obedience that's how the nations are going to be blessed. And ultimately, the nations are blessed how? Jesus. 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 That is ultimately, you remember that from Abraham and Sarah, there were going to be many kings born, right? The king of kings is Jesus. The ultimate blessing through the family of Abraham is, say it with me, Jesus, right. Um, what might God be asking you to give up to follow him? That was one question I think is really worth you thinking about. And to me, what I wrote, or I wrote down my rights. My rights. The things that I consider to be my rights. I put that in quotations. Uh, those are the th I, 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 To follow God, I've got to be willing to lay down my rights. Uh, what made Abraham righteous in God's sight? You read Romans chapter 4, 
right? Why did God credit righteousness into Abraham's account? It was because Abraham did what? Believed. Now, in Genesis chapter 17, what does God mark Abraham with? He, bar- he marks him with a physical mark. What is that physical mark? What is it? You can say it in church. It's all right. Circumcision. That's exactly right. Circumcision. That's the physical marking of the covenant. But what came first, the physical marking or the faith that compelled him to obedience? The faith that compelled him to obedience. So when we get to the New Testament, what do we see? We see the Jews still struggling with this, right? Is it the physical marking or is it the faith that moves to, compels to move to obedience? Well, Paul says we're justified by faith and not by works. And so that's a very important moment. Uh, let's see. Do we have some questions, Scott? All right. Well, do you mind running it up here? Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, why, why did God ask Abraham to sacrifice his son? What was, what was the, why did God do that? To test him, right? To test him. Do you trust me? And certainly... Certainly Abraham did because he says to Isaac on the way to the mountain, he says what? God will provide, right? God will provide, and God did provide. Um, Now the one thing that Jacob did do right as he was uh, preparing to meet Esau is is what? What did he do? He prays. (laughs) You catch that? Oh, God of my father Abraham and Isaac, right? I mean, he goes to God and he prays. And so there, there's, there's something incredible about um, there's something incredible about about those uh, about these stories again that direct us to God's faithfulness in light of man's flaws, doesn't it? Biblically, these characters are not always examples to follow. There are some things, even like my namesake David, is a is a is a as a man considered to be a man after God's own heart, but there are some there are a lot of parts of David's life I do not need to repeat, right? You agree with that? And so more, more than their lives as examples, God's faithfulness to not kill us for being stupid is what shines through every story. And there's not a single person in this room that is disqualified because of your flaws from being used for God's great purposes. Amen? Amen. All right, so we got one question. All right, it says on the six, and we've got two questions on one sheet. Uh, it says on the sixth day, man and female, he created them. Were there other people created with Adam before he was placed in the garden? The um, Paul, the apostle, says in Acts, as he is speaking to uh, is he speaking in Athens uh, to the, the wisest men of Greece, right? So he's speaking to the wise men of Greece, and he says to them, from one man, from one man, Adam, all human beings came. And, and, and also, Paul uses Adam as the, um, the federal head as, uh, for all humanity, because Adam sinned, we all sinned, right? And so the question is, uh, was Adam the first and only human being created and then God multiplied and, 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 and populated the world through Adam and Eve or was Adam and Eve the first family that we are told about? There were other families, but that's the family that God chose to tell us about. According to the Bible, according to the Bible, Adam is the biological father of all humanity, and he is the, um, not spiritually, but he's the federal head of us, and that through his sin, we all sin, right? And so that's why we needed a new Adam, right? Again, there we, here we have all this, this one story tied to the whole thing, that in that same area where we're being told that through Adam we all sin, that, and then through Christ, all those who believe, live right amen so again that's the story friends that's the story God is faithful 
to rescue broken human beings through his son, Jesus Christ. Uh, There's another question here. Why are the name changes significant to God? Well, again, I I think that it... um, in, in, in Abraham, the case of Abraham, he's just doubling down, right? From, from exalted father Abram to father of multitudes. I mean, he's, just, he's, just, he's saying, you're going to bear the name of the prophecy I'm going to fulfill in your descendants, right? He doesn't fulfill that in Abraham's lifetime, does he? Abraham has how many sons? Only two, right? Ishmael and, and Isaac. That doesn't sound like a multitude, but eventually those Jews, those Israelites, those Hebrews would be as many as would be like trying to count the s- grains of sand on the seashore. Say that five times fast. Or the stars in the sky. Uh, Jacob to Israel is another uh, example here. I very much think that God was changing the, 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 the trajectory of Jacob's life and descendants from a very earthy, uh, self-centered, self-preserving life to a Godward life, right? And so I, 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 just, I, I believe those name changes have great significance. Anybody else have a question? Uh, that you didn't, that you did fill out in your cards sitting beside you, or you, you want to, you just, it just dawned on you. Say, I want to ask this question. Excellent. All right, it is seven oh nine, and uh, so next week you're going to read chapter three, and um, I encourage you to to do that in such a way that you can take your time uh, to do so. Um, I encourage you to use Bible maps on, online. Uh, they're, they're everywhere. They're for free. Um, you know, Bible Hub. Is it Bible Hub? Is it dot .com or dot .org? But just look up Bible Hub. Oh, tons of resources at that website, Bible Hub. Lots of Bible translations. Um, we'll keep giving you resources. We'll keep talking to you about how to read the Bible. Um, every, 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 every chapter in the Bible with a wide-angle lens, right? And, and that, so when we do that, we read the Bible canonically, right? The Bible, this is what we call the rule the, or the canon. Um, this, 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 is the, this is our completed document of God's revelation. Uh, it is complete, and we need to read it all in the context of the whole, not just a part, And so that's what we want you to be doing, reading the Bible with a canonically, with a wide-angle lens, um, and remembering that the main things will always be plain things. Plain things are always right. And so you don't have to, you don't have to worry about if there's something that doesn't, that you don't understand, it's probably not a main thing. Okay, uh, so, all right, anything else? All right, so it's 7 now. The kids have got another 10, 15 minutes, and so be patient, visit with each other. The band's going to be coming in here to get ready to rehearse for Sunday morning, and so if we can kind of make our way towards the rear and let them get set up without worrying about us, I would, uh, that would be good. All right, let's pray together, and then, and then we'll go. Father, we... We're grateful for your uh, illumination, inspiration, revelation in this word. God, protected and preserved for us. Though humans have tried to destroy this word, though they have tried to um, make it obsolete, uh, they have tried to debunk it, they have tried to um, relegate it to, uh, to, to, to historical information. God, your word survives. Your word um, is exalted, your word continues to bring life through the revelation of your son, Jesus Christ. And so, God, we thank you for that. And, Lord, may we be hiding it in our hearts so that we will not sin against you. May we be ready to give a defense for the hope that is in us by talking to our children about the God that is, that is um, reflected, the God that is presented to us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in this word. You are the sovereign God. You are the creator of the world. And so, Lord, we ask you to protect our sweet friends that are 
testing positive. So many, many people testing positive. God, we thank you for those who have gotten the vaccine. We pray, God, that it will be effective. Lord, we pray that you'll protect your church, protect all people, God. Protect those those. Uh, those, those, those groups of people that are, that are most susceptible to the dangers of, uh, of COVID. Father, please, we pray in your timing, uh, get it out of here. Lord, we, uh, we pray for the comfort to the family and friends of Deb McCuller and as uh, pray for Brother John as he leads us in that service tomorrow. Lord, may, may you be blessed as we, as we honor you uh, through that time of remembrance. God, thank you. We praise you today for your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.